Выступает Луция Вам, который дает прекрасную операцию, и сейчас мы готовы послушать. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to talk about fat grafting. A lot of you, a lot of you already saw the surgery, so most of this is going to be philosophy. Um, no disclosures. Just the book I wrote about eight years ago. And you have to start understanding how aging of the face occurs. It's it's a volumetric loss around the entire face. But I want to dispel some myths. So I have some top ten myths out there. First. Fat is bioactive. As you heard me say this morning, if you gain weight, your face will look fat. So how much weight, it depends on how big you are as a person. It could, it's more percentage of body weight than anything else. Fat is permanent because this is a lady 10 years after a lip injection with fat and you can clearly see the fat lobules in there that I removed because fat stays around, it's permanent. So it is not temporary. It, it, the part that survives will continue and it's important you know that. The lower eyelid is safe. It is important, the technique I explained this morning where you're going deep and putting little bits in there is very safe. So all the stuff you see about lumpy bumpiness is due to technical error. If you don't go in from sideways with the fat, you should have very safe results. So I want to convince you of that area where you're scared to treat, start maybe with hyaluronic acid and see how well you do. Beware of the anterior cheek. As you heard me say, even a little bit of fat in the front cheek can look off, especially when they smile, it can look a little bit off. In the last few years, I'm using less and less fat there, almost none, and you saw none this morning in the live surgery. Cut the voodoo means there's so much stuff about, does it change the skin, do you, are there stem cell changes? And my answer is no, it just provides beautiful volume if done well. I am a proponent of single session, one treatment with fat, I don't believe multiple sessions work because you either have too little fat when you're done with multiple sessions or too much. If there is an inaccuracy with fat that you must know about. Fat needs a touch up. I use fillers to finish my fat and I tell all my patients beforehand expect to do a little in office fillers. Then you may ask do fillers last? Yes, I've noticed when you do a little filler it starts to last almost indefinitely, even if it's hyaluronic acid. Fat is not good for surface problems. So if you try to fix a wrinkle or other small flaw, it's very hard to do that. Fillers are the new fat. I'm doing a lot more fillers today than fat because usually the person that's perfect for fat for me has a lot of volume loss over 40 with stable weight. Fillers are good for anyone at any age and I use more fillers today because of this instrument as you saw in the demonstrations the cannula allows very precise work. But getting back to the big cannula with fat it's different from the small cannula but they all do the same thing which provide shaping and molding in a very safe way. Should you use implants well, today is a minimally invasive day and I would say that if the volume loss is mainly soft tissue, you should replace fat with fat. And if the person has a weak chin, then you probably need a chin implant. So don't put fat in here to make a chin implant and don't put fat, don't put an implant in here if they've just lost volume with soft tissue. So in other words, another way to look at it is in youth we have more soft tissue and hard tissue but we lose a greater proportion of soft tissue than hard tissue so in this slide you see as aging occurs we lose this coverage and what happens with an implant is you force the solid tissue up and it becomes more exposed and you have more aging potentially because you have to replace soft tissue so going back to the aging paradigm, if you do fat grafting, you increase the distance and you replicate youth. I always encourage my 
colleagues to think artistically. When you analyze a face, take a step back and look at the blink. In other words, in a blink of an eye, does this person look better? That's the question. And if you're saying, well, the fold looks better, but do they look better? And you're going to hear more of that in my next talk in about 15 minutes or 30 minutes. So look at the shape. And again, we'll go through more of this soon. But that 30-year-old shape is sometimes more ideal than a 20-year-old for many women because it's too round and the oval is what you're trying to create. So look at the perimeter of the face and take a step back because when you're 20 feet away, you can see if a woman is young or older, beautiful or not, or a man is, is attractive very quickly. Those shadows are so important. So when a face is wide, you can shape it to be better. When a face is slightly wide, you can just hit the halo of it and improve it. And this is a face that's more empty that I slightly widened. And a face I widened even more, but not making her look fat. And a face I widened even more, but does, I don't make her look fat. You see, each face is different. And a face that I widened even more, and she doesn't look fat. And a face I widened even more. And a face I widened even more. So these are just showing you gradations of shape that's so important. Remember that, as I said during my surgery, take your photographs without flash because they melt away your ability to see shadows. Because we live in a world with overhead light. And when light comes down, it is how light shadows on your face that we relate to aging. So don't have a big room with very little light, otherwise you look really bad. You have to have a small room and a lot of light, and then you create just enough shadow that simulates how we see each other. So, and make sure your door is closed. So when we're deflated like a balloon and light bounces better, our skin looks better. So I believe when people say the texture looks better and their stem cell changes, maybe there are, I don't know. I know that stem cells are the highest proportion in fat but I don't sell a package of a stem cell facelift or a stem cell fat graft. I explain how fat changes the way light strikes the face. Longevity. I do a lot of hair transplants, as some of you know, and studying the evolution of a hair graft, I see that fat has a similar trajectory over time. You initially go through too much swelling. You don't recognize yourself. Then you look almost perfect. I tell my patients, don't get too excited. It's gonna go down. Then you're gonna go through a period of time it's not as good. And if you wait, if you wait and you watch it, you slow, slowly see it gets better. So here's an example, one week out, one month out, maybe too full, three months out, maybe really good. I don't know, maybe it's too low. But it, it just watch it, six months, 11 months, 15 months, stable weight, no changes, fat changes. Now, if I put in more fat at three months, she would be too much. So why is that? Because when you take fat from the belly and thighs, it behaves very much like the fat from the belly. It's, it is very recalcitrant to loss. It, does, it doesn't get easily lost. That's just like a hair transplant. It's the donor hair, when you move it, acts still like this donor hair. So it has donor characteristics. I don't need to try to get my fat to take better because if it's near perfect at one time and slightly off the other, I don't want an overfilled face. I can clearly come back and touch it up easily. Okay, you've seen how I do it. I don't want to spend too much time with this, but I want to walk you through it one step at a time. So I first draw this complicated diagram out. Don't worry about it. Just understand the principles of shadows and look for the shadows that bother your eye and then draw it. You can just draw one circle. It doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. It's thinking to understand what are the shadows that count. I harvest, you saw me do that this morning. When you're in your inner thigh, be very careful, you go through that little fascial plane so don't, you don't create a, uh, a contour issue. I have my instruments, and this is just 
the instruments, and I actually loved the, uh, watching the other doctor use that gun. I probably will start using that gun. You harvest the fat, 10 cc syringe. You have this little thing that helps you not have to hold the suction on it. And then you take off, you put on the cap, pull out the plunger, put the cap on, I centrifuge 3,000 RPM for three minutes. You don't have to do that. And take it out sterilely. Everything is sterile. You see the supernatant of fat, lice fat, the blood below. Pour out the fat first. Always pour out the supernatant first, then empty the infernatant. You can drain a little bit more oil if you want. You don't have to do that. Don't make, make sure there's no cotton in there. I transfer everything to a larger 25 cc uh, cannula, uh, sorry, syringe, and then make sure I don't spray it across the room. And this allows an easy transfer to one cc syringes. I always have the camera, uh, sorry, the photos of the patient in the room for me to work with. And I just use usually 1.2 millimeters, occasionally 0 0.9, but mainly 1.2. And people ask me what planes I go into. It's really the plane of least resistance, except the lower eyelid where I go deep. So I usually, how many cc's? People always want to know how many cc's. I know that's a big question, so I'll answer it. As you heard this morning, I put between 0.5 to 1.5, no more, in the medial half. And I put one point, same thing in the outer portion. And then remember, I want to just spend a, few, a minute here on this slide. You want to have the globe protected with the non-dominant hand, and you want to feel this cannula bounce off the bone and dance across the orbital rim like this, putting a little bit at a time, like a 50th of a cc. That's why you saw me take about 10 minutes to do this. And I'm just dancing across, dancing across, the medial half. I, why do I divide medial and lateral? So I can keep my number counts, that's all. You, I'm gonna skip the video, you've seen it this morning, but that's it. And then remember to put some in the lateral canthus, which is very, very important because that's an area you'll have a dip. How much? About half a cc or so. Sometimes I put a little bit in the nasal jugal groove, which is medial, and that's very fast and easy, maybe half a cc to one cc. The brow, you saw, I now put a little bit more medial, and I put a little bit lateral as well, about maybe about half to two cc's. Always do less than you can. I'm going to skip over these videos for sake of time to stay on time. The anterior cheek today, I put very little or none because I believe that building the lower eyelid gives projection where you don't need the lift in the anterior cheek. As you heard today, I'm obsessed with the outer perimeter. I think you can put two or three cc's in and still be fine. Sometimes I put four to five. Today you saw I put five in. And this is just going now to the buckle zone and filling a, lot, a little bit in the buckle zone. How many cc's? Between zero to five. But generally speaking, always go less. See your results over a period of six months and then decide to go more. Because once you put it in, it's hard to fix. Sometimes you get a little bit more loss in this medial buckle zone when you fill it and you see those contours. Today you see me, you see me, you saw me go back and I can't speak English anymore. You saw me go back and put a little bit more. The pre-jowl, remember it also sags below the jowl, so you gotta go below the mandible to capture that. Then I fill, oh sorry, how many cc's? Three cc's, maybe two. Anterior chin, two, three, or four. You don't wanna put too much here because the, the, the mucosal wall is thin and they'll feel bulging if you start to put too much. If they feel bulging, leave it. It will settle within about a month, so don't worry. Lateral mandible, you saw me put a little bit there, not too much. You can sort of think of it like a tulip shape, in other words, like multiple directions. And how much do you put in? Always go back to your frontal view and look, are you creating a bulge? So between one or two cc's, very little, very little, and this is the third plane coming down. And then address the nasal ju jugal, sorry, the nasal labial groove and the canine fossa perpendicular to the line. Okay, perpendicular, and that's the nasal uh, labial groove. And I'm on time. So 
think as an artist. I always close with that because if you start to become more of an artist, you can create better results and then you constantly improve by improving your eye. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, I would love to do that. Okay. Uh,